My experience of uh, trade finance in general comes perhaps when I was 14, in fact, a lot earlier than perhaps many of you guys. And it came in the form of Shakespeare, believe it or not. And one of Shakespeare's plays is The Merchant of Venice. If anyone is, is familiar with that, the story goes where there is a, as a, as a young um, a Venetian of noble rank who wishes to woo Portia, who is sort of the princess far, far away. But he doesn't have the funds to go to Belmont and woo her and to take her hand in marriage, so he goes to solicit the help of Antonio, who is a, who is a rich uh, merchant then. And Antonio promises to, to be the guarantor of a bond if he can raise the money to, uh, to go to Belmont. So he solicits the help of Shylock, who is a money lender, and he agrees to, to, uh, to fund uh, the escapades. So then when he goes, to, when, when Bassanio goes to you know, woo Portia, he comes back to find out that Antonio's ships were lost at sea, so he's not able to pay back the bond. And although the 19th century trade finance and, and finance had not a lot to care about in terms of geopolitical risk, the modern day trade financier really needs to pay attention to it. And in understanding what makes the state important, I think there are four main things that we need to consider when understanding um, global risk and how nations become important and how they become valuable. So the first one would be their economic growth, the size of their active consumer market, their geopolitical uh, strategic positioning, physically where they are located on the map, and also uh, systemically important resources. That could mean oil and gas, or in modern day, that could also mean technology and innovation and IP. That can really change things. So if we were to plot, for example, different nations in the world to see um, their, uh, where they, they fit on this map, in general, I put some of these nations here. So I put Saudi Arabia right here. I put <coughs> Russia right there. I put Iran somewhere there. Put your neighbors Norway somewhere there. China sort of here-ish. And right now we have the United States right in the middle. Now there's a reason why the United States, I believe, is in the middle of this, uh, of this four, four circle matrix. And that goes back to their history and it goes back to three main key dates that I wanna talk to you about today which will lead off into the rest of the talk. So if you look at these four main dates and why they're there important. We have initially the Brent Woods Agreement, which formed the monetary policy of the developed world or what was to become the developed world. Uh, fully integrated monetary order, which created the IMF and the World Bank. You also have World War II and the ending of that. You also have the UN Charter signed shortly afterwards as well. Then we have uh, the Marshall Plan, which really helped to rebuild Europe. Europe and Britain arguably were the most powerful regions in the world which dictated a lot of things and which really led the world in many aspects. But as World War II ended, Europe became sort of a secondary power with the United States taking advantage of this, not in any malicious way, I guess, but in a way to rebuild and lead on that uh, front. And in terms of the Marshall Plan, they had two main aims in that. The first was to rebuild Europe by these means, to physically rebuild the war-torn uh, regions, to remove trade barriers, and to also modernize industry. Uh, they injected 12 billion worth of economic uh, recovery resources, which totals around 100 billion in today's money. And secondly, and obviously, the second major thing they want to do is to stop the spread of communism. We had the Soviet Union and the, the United States as the two leading powers then. And at the end, sort of around, obviously, the, the, the turn of the 1990s, we saw the Soviet Union collapse, which really led the United States to be the major power in that sense. And the characteristics of US power really were twofold. Firstly, they led in the creation of the financial system, and also they were a, perhaps an unchallenged power since at least the 1990s. And that consolidation of power led them to be very, very important. But as we see the world changing now, the United States is not really playing a major role, or as major as it used to. And there's many people who say that the reason as to why they're not paying, playing such a major role in world affairs is because for some reason the belief is that they're taking a step back or they're taking a back seat in being the world policeman, and, uh, which is causing opportunistic uh, re uh, nations and situations to come to fill that vacuum of power. But in my point of view, that's a very wrong explanation as to why the world has changed and why the United States is not the major lead power in, in at least uh, the Western world. Firstly, I think it's a very simplistic argument to make, although they were a leading power uh, in the beginning, uh, it's not to say that the reason as to why they're not anymore is because they're taking a, step, taking a step back. Secondly, I believe although they played a major role, it's, this explanation is very US-centric, meaning as if sort of they 
because they began the process to say that the reason why it's not happening is because they're taking a back seat isn't really the right explanation either. I think a very correct explanation as to why the U.S. is really changing their, uh, their stance and why other powers are becoming more important is because financially nations which have developed a lot, a lot later are now developing the, the abilities to enact the last four circles that we saw. Their GDP is growing, they're able to take care of their own nations and then their, their intentions and ambitions grow as a result of their financial growth as well, which is why we see hotspots in different parts of the world growing at different paces. So we see the um, uh, Saudi Arabia and the GCC developing in times of their economic growth and other nations too. I've got a few graphs to show you uh, what this really means in practice. So this is a straight graph that um, we pulled from the World Bank data, also plotted by some of our, uh, some of our data points here. So this is the GCC, the Gulf, Corpor uh, the Gulf Co Corpor Corporation Council. And we see as, and we pick Saudi Arabia as, as an example, as they are the leading player in the GCC. As their, their GDP grew, and we use GDP as a, as a proxy for economic growth because there's a lot of black money that can't be accounted for and other aspects, but this is what we can measure. And we have different parts. This is obviously not a complete list, but some really focused parts of how they've developed and why they've developed power structures in line with their development. So right now we see the uh, oil blockade of uh, the early 1970s with the Yom Kippur, with the Yom Kippur War, which saw oil prices quadruple. Later on in the 80s, they take full control of Aramco, which allows them to develop really internally as a major oil supplier. The year after that, as they are at the peak of their, uh, of their development, they form the GCC Corporation Council, um, which them obviously being a major leader in. They joined the, uh, the WTO about 12, uh, in uh, 2005, after 12 years of talks with the uh, WTO. Again, uh, at the peak again of their power, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Qatar agree the final delineation of borders between themselves and Qatar in 2008. Then we obviously have the financial crash, but that doesn't mean their power went down because of that too. In fact, they grew substantially after that as their power got consolidated. Then a big key marker here is the US selling them $60 billion worth of arms, the most lucrative single arms deal in history, which really substantiates their physical dominance and also the aspirations in being a regional power, really challenging the US-centric model. Again, as they continue, three major things happen in 2017. The Qatar blockade, as we saw, Mohammed bin Salman becomes the crown prince, and also the corruption purge in Saudi Arabia becomes, as the leadership becomes younger, and as they become more aspirational as a nation. And they lead in the GCC, and uh, these are the reasons I believe why. You also have a key mark here for, for Russia, and I think <coughs> Russia is a bit different in, the, in, the, in that s space because they've had a history of being a global power in the past. That wasn't meant to be after the 1990s, but they have a, they have a history and, and, and uh, alliances, and they have uh, experience in dealing internationally and in being a, a world power. But the way that they have done it after the fall of uh, communism has changed. They've become more strategic, more opportunistic perhaps, in their approaches, which has caused their um, sort of line of development to really start really early on in the early 1990s because of their experience. We see there that the Soviet Union collapsed, obviously, in the early 90s. Uh, but then Russia takes up the seat of the Soviet Union at the, uh, the UN Security Council, which allows them to keep their nuclear weapons, which really kept them uh, front and center of world affairs. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all, but we'll pick key dates. Then Putin wins the presidential elections in, uh, in, the, in the 2000s, which really leads them almost in an unbroken set of, of events, and their power grows and develops accordingly. Again, at their peak of their power, they invade Georgia in 2008. The financial crash happens, but, the, but then again, their, uh, their power doesn't really secede. Moved on a couple of more years down the line. The, one of the biggest protests in Russia since the fall of communism against the, uh, against the, the elections happened, although the, um, the government curtails that. You have the annexation of Crimea in 2014, which, which really saw the decline of their economy, but nonetheless, not the decline of their power. And then the two sort of uh, foreign, uh, foreign uh, interventions, I guess you call them in Syria and also in Libya in modern times. I think this is the map, this is the last one, which I think we'll find very interesting. And this is the difference between the US and China in their GDP growth, but also in their power. And we can see a steep rise in China's GDP, 
which I think corresponds to their steep rise also in their international ambitions. So again, China joins the WTO in 2001. They continue and they sign uh, trade agreements with 10 Southeast Asian nations, which unites 25% of the world's population. So again, they have the financial capacity and the unity there to really cause problems for, uh, for the West. Then symbolically, they launch their first uh, manned spacecraft, which makes them the third uh, nation on, in history to launch um, a manned spacecraft. Then the Sino-African summit begins, and they sign deals. In 2009, there's a 17.7% rise in exports, which sees them overtake Germany as the world's largest exporter, which I find you know, interesting in, the, in that aspect. And then another big number is here, that in 2012, official figures suggest that city dwellers outnumber the rural population. So we see a concentration into the cities, we see industrialization really skyrocket from there and their technological capacities also develop. Their military ambitions also are seen in, early, in the, well, the mid-2000s, I guess, in 2012, with their sea skirmish between uh, the Philippines and, and China, and then the relaxation of their one-child policy. And now we see, in modern terms, their uh, technological bout between the West and also them, and examples of that being Huawei and the, uh, and the um, pessimism that the, the U.S. has over Chinese uh, dominance in that space, perhaps because the U.S. knows the capability that they've developed, and they know that if China develops the same stronghold on key parts of the world, they can really be a formidable, a formidable power. Now, understanding now why nations, uh, how they become important, what happens when nations become wealthier? Well, firstly, I think, and there's about four main points here to consider. But firstly, they, they become more uh, important. When they become wealthy, they, they become more important to the international order and to also how trade works and how it operates. Firstly, obviously, the domestic markets are realized and they expand, which allows them to be um, attractive for foreign investors, for exporters. As we can see, the Chinese market is the biggest market. Many people want to uh, sell into that. China has great controls over that, and they use that as leverage in their negotiations. Their, for, their foreign policy capabilities also grow substantially. We see this in all parts of the world, where they develop the financial ability to maintain their own economies. The next part of the phase is to look outwardly, and this is why we see flashpoints in different parts of the world as the nations grow and develop financially. The international alliances also strengthen, which causes even more complexities in the international order. It's no longer a simple case of the Soviet Union and, and the West. We have these smaller players regionally causing havoc. So in trade terms, in the finance terms, uh, you know, companies can no longer have a regional response. They need to have country by country specific responses as this grows and proliferates. And obviously their ambitions become more aggressive. That could mean in a military sense or even financial senses, they go for what they want and they, and they show it in, different, in many different ways. We can see this with the China-US uh, trade war right now. If China wasn't as strong as they were, if they didn't have the leverage that they have, then they wouldn't be anywhere close to causing as much disturbance as they are, uh, or as much challenge as they are right now. And if you couple these into, into what the response of a nation is, there's three main things that a nation can do to show their power. Firstly, they use conventional warfare. In these days, it's developed and it's changed into also using proxies and terrorist groups have developed and evolved through the conventional warfare means. Secondly, they use trade and finance as a weapon to get their ambitions realized. And thirdly, they use technological warfare, whether that's uh, cyber security and also something that we focus on, outer space um, security and innovation. So technology is becoming a very strong arm of nations and regions to really show their power and create the, uh, change the rules-based order that we've enjoyed since the end of World War II, which is really putting a spanner in the works for businesses who want to operate in all parts of the world. They really need to take into consideration how these changes come about. And in defense terms, if you couple these all into one phrase, this would be called a hybrid warfare scenario of how nations develop and how they change. So this matters to you guys, I think, in three main ways. Now, this is sort of quite high-level stuff, but if we get into the reasons as to why you should care about it, there's three main reasons as to uh, what this really means to uh, the world of trade finance and trade in general. Firstly, the characteristics of nations, they become more internally chaotic as 
powers grow. So this really matters in the trade and political risk insurance um, uh, side of things. And if I read out some statistics quickly and some knowledge from your peers here, we can see how, this, uh, how the CPR uh, market has grown and developed. The credit uh, BPL Global, the broker, uh, publishes uh, yearly reports on how their market and how their products have changed and grown throughout, uh, throughout time. And it shows that uh, many things have changed and, and developed. One of the ma ma major things that we see here is that there's been a growing demand for longer-term coverage for exporters, irrespective of financing, with the average policy period requested being 5.2 years in 2019. This perhaps doesn't really matter too much for the bankers in here, but for the underwriters and for those who take out uh, insurance policies, it raises costs tremendously as skirmishes happen in different parts of the world. We can see this also in the um, Strait of Hormuz, where, where insurance premiums skyrocketed tenfold after the issues there, which adds costs onto to, to freights and to carriers, which these costs then are probably passed on to the end consumer as well. So it just tightens, um, it tightens pockets, which isn't really good. Africa continues to represent the largest regional exposure, accounting for just over 20% of their portfolio in terms of this kind of insurance being offered. And also, secondly, in 2019, we see a new insurance consortium being created in 2019, led by specialist insurance providers and underwriters Neon and MS Amlin, as a response for the growing need of political risk and credit insurance grows too. So there's been a concentrated effort in London to provide this insurance because risks are growing in different parts of the world. And also something to consider and keep in mind is that uh, in, as supply chain shift, the actual um, the matrix which was meant to be created to be smooth has now changed into, into a different beast altogether. And what does this really mean? As geopolitical risk rises, we have exporters and importers are finding it increasingly difficult to adapt, which is resulting in a growing number of insolvencies, especially within Asia and the MENA region. This comes from the BPL report. This causes uh, an insolvency domino effect. Uh, as supply chain's prosperity is reliant on a robust network, when one of these nodes fall, this really affects the whole system. And this is a, a, a picture that I picked up uh, from their, uh, their uh, report showing how, how uh, rates of uh, political risk and credit insurance has been growing in these parts of the world, which I've seen perhaps more developed, especially in the United States and, and the UK. And also these are the other regions which we see a rise in inquiries for uh, political risk and credit insurance. Secondly, nations become externally defensive. And this is shown, perhaps, in trade, protect and trade protectionism. And there's a report by uh, Gaolin, which is uh, Gaolin WLG, which is the law firm, which really explains how the world has become much more defensive in their trade policies. And they mentioned that in uh, the world's top six economies have adopted more than 7,000 protectionist trade measures since 2008. This includes, obviously, the United States, but a lot of trade protectionism from the U.S. has come long before Trump even came into office. The EU is also making it harder for nations uh, outside of the bloc to, to trade with it, they mention here, in creating over 5,500 policies deemed restrictive to international trade since 2009. We mentioned the uh, U.S. as well. And also Argentina, funnily enough, and India are the biggest proponents of protectionism in recent years. Only Brazil, Saudi Arabia, and Tunisia have really loosened their borders in terms of their trade policies, which is making it easier for them to trade. But the world in general is going towards more protectionism, making it difficult and more expensive to trade with your neighbors and with the international community, really going against you know, the, the principles and policies put forward after World War II that shaped the world we see today. And finally, and I think this is perhaps one of the most interesting, is that multilaterally nations are becoming a lot more aggressive in, in, um, in putting down what they believe their aims to be and really enacting on it. And in this case, I'm going to focus on two main characteristics in terms of sanctions. Firstly, it's, it's, the, it's the almost now aggressive nature which we see the US sanctioning body, OFAC, and also the EU sanctioning body in really working against each other, making it difficult for companies to comply with both sets of sanctions, which is raising costs considerably. 
And uh, this really began, I think, or it really manifested itself after the U.S. came out of the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which really threw a big span in the works of collaboration and cooperation between what was historically the two uh, most reliant on uh, blocks, i.e. the EU and also America, and that friendship really got tested when this happened. Um, they made it more difficult. They made it more difficult. The, the U.S. to comply with uh, international uh, international companies uh, need to, to really have pick which sanctions body we're going to comply with: the EU's or the U.S.'s. And it becomes really problematic when we see that in some cases EU rules make it illegal to follow U.S. sanctions. And we're going to go into that more deeply now. Uh, there are laws in the EU known as blocking regulations, which prohibit EU companies from allowing from following U.S. secondary sanctions, for example. The regulation was updated in response to the U.S. withdrawal from the Iran deal, which really puts companies between a rock and a hard place. And there are exemptions that EU companies can make to the EU, but the, the threshold is very high, and they don't publish what are the criteria for this, and they don't say who we've uh, allowed to escape these sanctions, which is putting a lot, a lot, lot of pressure on companies, and also which is causing um, you know, growth and development internationally to go by the wayside. Also, the list of sanctions, persons, and entities differ from both sides. So again, even if they didn't have these laws into place, knowing who you work with and complying with sanctions is becoming a lot more difficult. And costs are rising because of it. Compliance is the biggest cost for any financial institution nowadays, and it's set to rise even further as the UK develops their own sanctioning uh, body as well as they leave uh, the EU. But we'll get into that. Yes, and also OFAC, uh, in some cases, also encourages companies to voluntarily disclose violations in exchange for softer sentences. So they say, you know, if you tell us, we'll give you a softer sentence, but if you find out, we're going to go hard on you. And given the response to uh, sanctions violations is also different from the U.S.'s standpoint, which is very aggressive, it's also the EU. Different EU nations have different responses to sanctions. In some cases, they're, they're, they're legal, which causes, you know, different sentences. In some cases, uh, you only get uh, administrative um, um, black marks against uh, your, your name. So internally, the EU doesn't have a, cons uh, um, a consistent response to sanctions violations. But this picture becomes increasingly more complex when we consider Brexit. And the spanner that that threw in the works in the last three years trying to negotiate and figure out what Brexit actually meant, which is, uh, which is uh, a thorn in the paw of many policymakers that I know. But in terms of sanctions, now the U UK will need to develop their own sanctions uh, priorities and their own classifications of what they deem uh, to be allowed and not allowed. And many EU companies are hoping that this regulation looks a lot like the EU stance for obvious reasons, but we'll see in which direction they really, uh, they really go with that one. There's pressure on the US side to make it more appear more uh, like the US, and the EU is doing the same thing. So being as many companies are registered and based in the UK and do and work in different parts of the world, many EU companies also trade heavily with the UK, which really puts a strain on how they'll do business and the cost of business going forward. So this period now, this transition period is going to be a key part for many people in the financial services, definitely to keep an eye on, but also general people who trade and anyone who has relations with both the EU and the UK to really focus on, on what uh, the deal will look like. Uh, and this is actually a direct quote from the UK's website on what their stance on sanctions actually is. So I'll give you a chance to read that now. So again, the, the actual uh, guidelines are very, uh, very succinct, exactly. <laughs> They're very much succinct. You know, they'll apply until the 31st of December. After that, we don't know yet. You guys need to wait and see. And in particularly, to stick on the point of Brexit, you know, I speak a lot about, about Brexit on, uh, with different companies and also on, te on television quite often. And the biggest thing that I see with Brexit is that when it was announced as an idea in the first place, they, the UK government, not even the UK government, but those who wanted Brexit, because even within the government there was people who wanted it and those who were staunchly against it, they didn't have a coherent understanding or, or really a message as to what that would mean afterwards for businesses, for the communities in different parts of the world to trade with the EU and the UK, which led to the mess that we see today. And this mess will not be solved until they really find out, well, I guess the, the period of Brexit has, has passed, but now they need to find out how they take the relationship with mo moving forward. And things like sanctions and protections measures don't help the picture. So I think I'll leave it there, and I'll take any questions you have. So thank you very much.
Yes. So the coronavirus will, uh, at least in the short term, lead to isolation, criticism, and border checks, and uh, and uh, breaking maybe some of the free movement rules. Yeah. Uh, do you think it, if it continues, it will have a bigger impact than that? We were just speaking about about uh, coronavirus with the gentleman there, and I think something that I find very interesting is that coronavirus and also global warming are two instances where the world has come to well, perhaps not so much with global warming, but where they need to come together globally for a global response. And we see right now, forget about markets, which always act very irrationally in, in general. They sort of they, they overextend themselves. But in terms of the day-to-day -day operations, think of it like traffic. When traffic moves back and forth, it's very easy, things get done, but when there's a block up of traffic, people can't get, 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 get to work, which causes many bad things to happen outside. But right now, I think finding a cure is obviously the biggest uh, response. Also, governments have a big responsibility, in my eyes, to really um, to calm, to calm the situation, to really provide leadership globally in how they respond to this and give confidence to businesses and how they uh, plan to respond to this and what they can do to uh, hedge their uh, to hedge uh, their risks and also to make them uh, you know survive in these next few months. I think the situation will get worse before it gets better for sure, because uh, we see such a global uh, this uh, uh, sort of very ununified response in different parts of the world. Actual borders are being closed, visas are being restricted, so a lot of preemptive measures are being taken. But in terms of next steps forward, this will take time. But a definitely a united uh, voice needs to be had for this to be solved. Maybe a follow-up question. You sort of implied that the Washington consensus, consensus being dead yeah. is not the explanation for the world going yeah. to a chaotic place, but now you're kind of implying that the world could reunite to kind of Washington consensus. Uh, uh, the, the, the way, th I mean, for sure the world is, n is the U.S. no longer leads the world in many different things because there's other regional players that have a big impact. Right now, the U.S.'s voice in the Middle East, for example, wasn't as strong as it was in the past. You know, Saudi Arabia doesn't need the protection that it once got from the USA. They have the means to protect themselves. They bought a lot of weapons, as you saw on the slide before, to protect themselves anyway. And they have problems within their own communities and within their own regions in terms of, uh, in terms of that response. But in terms of the world response for corona, I think they're not doing it for any benefit to themselves. They're doing it for the benefit of all. So I think they can put their swords and guns down to the side for the bigger purpose of really, of really helping this. Because if this spreads, it's not going to only affect one nation. It's not going to stop at the border and say, you don't have a visa to come in coronavirus, you're going to stay there. Until you get your visa, it spreads and it grows. So this puts the world economy at risk, also world health at risk, uh, and the perceptions of world health at risk. I think people respond to the perceptions of what a risk is, not to the actual underlying risk itself. And right now, the media isn't helping by always promoting where it's gone wrong and really keeping, uh, keeping the, the nation really tense or keeping the world really tense by the way that they r report on it, even though factually corona isn't as dangerous as, let's say, SARS was and the rates of death uh, aren't as much as SARS was. You know? So if scientists were to be on the news m m more often, provide leadership in that sense, I think the world's response would be a lot more uh, mature and responsible than what we see now. But also it's the case that that um, we, as we've gone through periods of, of, uh, of shocks in the past, let's say terrorism, when 9-11 happened, there was a big uh, response to that, and the world was very unsure of how to respond to this kind of threat. So they overextended by, you know, the Bush's war on terror, but as they got more mature and they understood the situation further, they built it in to their risk matrices, and they really, you know, it got, it got absorbed into their understanding of how the world has changed. Coronavirus, as well as technology, as well as geopolitical risk, will also, over time, be absorbed into a nation's and company's understandings. There's obviously growing pains in the beginning, and panic sets in if you let it, because the world is so interconnected that you need to show response quickly, straight away, to show leadership, but people need to take a much more uh, long-term view and a lot more um, responsible view in how they respond to these global challenges, not just jump at the first sign of, uh, of panic. Sure. I mean, you said that the, the U.S. is sort of retreating from its role as global police at the same time. Uh, you've also pointed to the use of technology as a proxy weapon. Yeah. Uh, and we've all seen the big, and some people getting caught in the middle of that, like the UK, yeah. the current debate over the use of Huawei yes, technology right. for 5G. Yeah. Um, it, is that, do you think, uh, is that an attempt by the U.S. to reassert itself? And who, who do you think is going, three questions, is yeah. it? 
Is it uh, sorry about that? No, no, is it is it please. depends on the US to reassert itself in the in the area? Yeah, I didn't want to hear the question. Can you can you sorry. Sorry. Yeah, take it off. Yeah, yeah, I was asking about the US yeah. and technology. Um, the retreat of the US which role of the global policeman, the importance of technology as a, as a, as a proxy weapon. And um, referring to what's going on with Huawei and 5G in the UK, yeah. which you may or may not follow here, but the US putting a lot of pressure on yeah. the UK government. Yeah. So uh, the, two, the two big blondes fighting it off <laughs> on the use of, uh, the use of Huawei That's right. uh, in, in, uh, in UK networks. Is this, my well, first question is, sure. is this an attempt by the US to reassert itself? Is technology the ready the battlefield yeah. uh, for the future? Yeah. And my third question is, uh, or are there other things, other parts of the hybrid warfare? Yeah. And uh, what does this mean for trade finance? Because we're here, we're in a, we're in a, we're talking about fintechs today. We've seen all the different systems, the blockchains, the non-blockchains, mm. all the different utilities. What does it mean for us? As, Trade finance that's, that's good. So, in terms of the first point, I don't think the U.S. is retreating in any. In when you say retreating, that means different things to, to, to different people. They're obviously their foreign policy ambitions have changed. You know, they're, they're they're coming out of certain parts of the world like Syria. They have made it clear that they don't want anything to do with the situation. And in small cases like this, we have opportunistic powers coming in to fill the void of what the U.S. had. But they're just changing their response to the global system. They can no longer be the lead power because there are so many challenges from different parts of the world and they can't financially, I don't think, really keep up with everything. And I think the leadership right now has a very different tack to how he wants to respond to the world. A lot more efficient, perhaps, a lot more transactional responses to world affairs. And he doesn't see it as necessary being in different parts of the world. He wants the US to grow in its own sense and having foreign troops in different parts of the world isn't going to help that. That's not to say that they don't have bases in almost every part of the world. They still have a physical presence there, but in terms of their active deployment and their active uh, foreign policy um, in terms of conventional warfare ambitions, there's no longer a need to do that, but you can really assert power in different ways. Technology, going into the second point, is a perfect example of this. And in my you know, research and study, I'm actually talking to the RAF uh, in a keynote about this uh, in May in, in London, obviously, speaking about how cyber, how cyber and also outer space uh, so, uh, is changing the notion of sovereignty in general and how you know, technology is, is the new phase of warfare and the hybrid sense of warfare is making it that even smaller powers which don't have the physical ability to go out there and attack a nation can buy software from different parts of the world and deploy that in whichever way they want to. It's becoming cheaper, it's becoming more widely available and we have non-state actors really taking up uh, the mantle of change for probably bad ways uh, to make their points heard more clearly. As technology, because the main part of technology, Sean, I think, is that it, demo, it, uh, it makes it more democratic. Anyone who has the ability to understand it and can pay for it can use it, whether that's a state actor, a non-state actor, or just someone in their bedroom hacking into systems, which is really changing the way we see the world and who we blame for things going wrong. You know? And world leadership needs to respond to this, and right now they're not homogenized in this at all. Especially we see the relationship between the, the, the US and Europe has been strained dramatically, extremely, by this. We see also the US, you know, in, in, I think it was in 2016, they put tariffs on, on, on steel and aluminium, you know, which uh, even though the biggest producers of steel and aluminium were, were the Chinese, and he's dealing with the, the Chinese in, in his own way, old uh, relationships now need to modernize, naturally. You can't have the same relationship throughout time because if you do, if you keep it, you keep it there artificially, which doesn't mean you're really changing with the times. That doesn't mean they're enemies by any stretch, but the way that they interact is going to be very different because there's so many different factors to consider, which isn't really too well understood by, by, uh, by the top, I don't think. And also, by the time it's understood, implementation takes time to actually do and to put into force. Policy, as you mentioned in your talk before, technology is outpacing law, uh, laws and policies, which is putting you know, policymakers on the back foot, always trying to catch up to the next innovation. When the innovators are doing it, despite of, despite of uh, the laws and policies being in place. So in terms of that, that means for trade, trade finance, I think you need to be more agile, especially as you know, um, trade, uh, the, the, the supply chains are changing. They're changing more dramatically, be it because of geopolitical risk or the coronavirus or because of techno uh, technology. The way that we did things in the past, it was easier because we worked in more developed markets. You know, finance grew substantially within Europe and America. And then as nations became 
uh, more financially viable, these investments went into emerging markets. That's why we have the term emerging markets or frontier markets. They're not developing the abilities to, to, to have a strong offering in their region, which puts uh, trade finance in a good position to go to these places. But then these same guys have the power to change policies and make laws which aren't dictated by the, the world powers as much as it was done in the past. So you need to have, as I mentioned, no more long, you can't have a MENA outlook. You need to have a country by country specific outlook. And that needs to be revisited a lot faster and you have engagement with the policy makers. You can't really rely on analysts sitting in their offices in London or wherever in the West to understand what's happening in Vietnam. You need to really engage with that part of the world to see how the, the, the leaders are thinking about things. The same way we did it in Europe, we did it because we were in the same neighborhoods. You know, we came now from, you know, I came and you came from London in Helsinki for this conference. We need to do the same thing in different parts of the world to keep it, um, each other informed and engaged by the, the, the changing nature of, of the world. And this goes back to the four main aspects of trade, that's right, of technology, um, uh, geopolitics, globalization, and societal change. Societies are changing as well. Individual people, consumers are becoming more informed, which is causing them to put pressure on governments and on, um, on companies to be more, more transparent. We have ESG becoming a thing now in investment due to people being more informed about things, which is changing the, uh, the, sort of, uh, the, the power structures in, in finance and in business. I, mean, I think you make a very good point about actually the, one of the benefits, which I've probably never really considered, of uh, agile technology is that you can move in and out of markets actually yeah. much more easily exactly. uh, in the same way as you say terrorists and, and, and others. Um, you know, it's uh, having everybody on a global, um, uh, on, a, on a virtual platform yeah. is much easier. You're in one sense far less vulnerable. In another sense, of course, you're very vulnerable to, yeah. uh, to, to hackers and so on. That's all the sort of cyber security. Yeah. So, yeah. again, that's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. In the back? Hi, uh, Tim Sennett, Supply Plus. We uh, spoke briefly on LinkedIn on the event. Do, do, uh, do you want to give, give him the mic? We spoke briefly on this topic over LinkedIn. That's right. I'd like to get ahead of these things. I'm Very good, yeah. I'm Very active, that's good. Um, kind of, it strikes me that going back to high level stuff, that trade, trade changes in some ways, but in fundamental ways, it always stays the same. In that trade is mostly about dealing with strange foreigners who you don't really trust. And that, you know, that never changes, and we can we put strategies and systems in place to deal with that. To mitigate that, yeah. The fundamentals are still there. Um, and I think over time we become too comfortable within, a, within an existing system. Mm. And as we've seen in the last few years, relatively simple and easy acts of democracy mm. or well, acts mm. of politics rather can overturn those sim those uh, those those system those yeah. systems very easily. Um, my my question is: Do you think there's a danger of over systematizing trade, which is fundamentally a risky and aggressive thing? Mm and becoming too comfortable yeah. and kind of exacerbating the inevitable shocks mm -hmm. when, when the twig snaps. Yeah. Well, we in the West have sort of a benefit and a, and a drawback in that we've created the rules-based order and we benefit from that. But then how do we allow emerging markets and frontier markets to really uh, plug in to the system we've created? They don't have the infrastructure in place. They don't have the, for example, to be more specific, the KKYC and AML infrastructures in line with our ones, which is why we, we spoke again with someone else, which is why the trade finance gap is growing. And it's going to continue to grow for SMEs in different parts of the world. So we are a victim of our own success in, in, in a sense. And I'll give you a perfect example. And I won't mention any names. I don't think anyone here would know this organization anyway, because they're, they're, uh, they're an asset manager based in, uh, in London. I sat down with him with the, with the CIO. And I asked him, you know, who does your political risk analysis? Like who keeps an eye out on the ground for you? Like, how do you know how the world is changing? And he goes, oh, we don't do uh, political risk. I said, oh, that's interesting. How do you do it then? He goes, oh, we read the FT. You know, that was his response. And he sort of, uh, that, my jaw dropped when, when I heard that, you know. I think if you, if you play in more established markets, and that's where your core base is, then you don't really need to care about what's happening. But as the world becomes more globalized, as trade, in essence, you trade with partners, as you mentioned, that you don't, you don't, don't know, Trying to over uh, over -system systematize it doesn't leave room to be adjustable when you need to be. When things happen in the world where your systems can't 
can't mitigate these risks, what's the point of creating these systems in the first place? You need to be a lot more, and how you do that is very up to the organization, up to the consensus that, that we build, but we find that homogenous rules can't really work, especially in the beginning stages, because the way I see the and I don't have a graph, how I love making graph, I don't have the graph for it, but we see we're, we're sort of probably 40% in to the development, the modern development of our, of, of society, I think, post-World War II, right? And I mentioned that for a reason. You know, World War, before World War II, we had sort of Europe and the empires which really ruled and really had a stronghold of world affairs. You know, the sun had never set on the, on the British Empire in the past. After World War II, we saw it sort of flat, flatten, and the U.S. took over. Now, as globally nations become more advanced, it's becoming harder for those who want to take advantage of the arbitrage of price and of, uh, of going to cheaper places. As that grows and develops, we're going to see the bigger place in the past, i.e. the U.S., change their response and change their position in the world. So we're only really in, to, we, we, I think we're only 40% in to our modern day development because technology is going to be a thing that we don't know which way, which route it will take. But for, for sure, I don't think homogenous, you know, archaic old systems can really work in new marketplaces because they're designed for different reasons and they're designed in different, they're designed in different times, you see, which is going to make it difficult for us to respond to any new challenges that we face. So you think the, the fallout from the decline of a particular system just inevitable and it is it is 100 percent it, it doesn't in any way mean that we should be suspicious of creating elaborate systems in the first place i think naturally the world develops and 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 and, and changes and we need to be ready for that and sometimes it's more difficult for us reaping the benefits of the system which has been created for us to really change our psychologies and and what we what we think we can benefit in the future because we're, we're sort of born into having uh, systems in place for us that were, were built by generations past. But the world is changing now substantially so that players which in the past didn't have much power now have the power to be a major force in that part of the world. And the effects of that is trade and the effects of that is commerce. Right? But the substantial part of, of a nation from many, many years analyzing it is that you need to have your defenses and your economy in place first. And then you deal in using trade as a weapon and also as, as a, the ability to use trade as a weapon and also as a benefit to your own agenda. But it's definitely changing. You need to be aware of how it's changing. Okay, thank you very much. Pleasure. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you.